Okay, let me mute my phone. Just to pronounce your name correctly, is Del Vart Andras, or what? what is the correct spelling? Andras Velvart. You you want to do it in the other way because we Hungarians oh, have okay. our first Andras. names as the second one. <laughs> okay, okay. Andras Velvart. Is it correct? Okay, Andras Velvart. Wondering if your device supports the Mixed Reality Toolkit? Well, I have great news. The Mixed Reality Toolkit has cross-platform support. So what that means is that you're pretty flexible with regards to which device you could actually use. Now, beyond the HoloLens and the HoloLens 2, you can deploy projects that make use of the Mixed Reality Toolkit to a variety of devices, which include the HTC Vibe, Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest, Android and iOS devices, as well as the Leap Motion by Ultraleap.
Hello everyone, I uh, hope you have enjoyed the first day of the event. We will start today. My name is Gonzalo Pratens and I will be here with you for a couple of sessions. We will start with uh, Andras uh, uh, that uh, you will bring us the um, uh, very interesting presentation uh, about uh, Lego bricks. <laughs> I don't think so. I think we will talk about really, uh, really cutting edge technology. Uh, welcome uh, to Andras. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Gonzalo. How are you? Fine, thank you. I hope you, everything is fine. Uh, I will then put the, your presentation on the screen also, and I will remove myself. If you need anything, just write on the chat. I will be also um, <coughs> viewing the comments. If uh, everything comes up, I, I will stop it. Good. Enjoy. Thank you. Okay, put this here. So, hello, welcome everyone to Lego Bricks of AR and VR. My name is Andras Verwart. I'm an AR, VR, MR, XR, whatever consultant. You can see my Twitter and blog and email address right there. I've been a Microsoft MVP for 14 years now, and I've been working with uh, um, all of these technologies basically since um, HoloLens has been released, so that's something like six years now. And let's get into it. What is this uh, What is this talk about? Well, if you want to be like the credible hook and uh, talk uh, intelligently about VR, AR, MR, XR, waveguides, light fields, degrees of freedom, and the whole host of other stuff, then you have come to the right place because I'm going to give you a short introduction of these these basic building blocks into this uh, wonderful world of uh, of uh, AR and VR, and I'm not gonna say the word metaverse. So let, let's start at the beginning. What is VR? So VR, uh, as you know, it takes you into a digital world. So that's the key differentiator here. You are immersed in a digital world. It basically takes away your eyes and ears. Those are the two um, two senses that we are currently um, attacking with uh, these technologies. And eyes and ears, uh, so basically what you see is everything is digital. What you hear is almost everything is digital. You are transformed into a brand new world. You are transformed into a brand new world so much that you don't even realize what's going on around you in the real world. For example, here are a bunch of journalists uh, who would give half their kidney just to interview Mark Zuckerberg, who is walking down the lane just uh, a couple of feet from there. And they have no idea that he's there because they are watching the VR stuff that they're watching. So unlike VR, AR, which is augmented reality, it adds digital information to the real world. So the the show, the start of the show is still the real world, the world that we're living in. And with AR, we're just augmenting it. We're just adding information to it. And whether the information that you're adding is uh, a couple of cute uh, animals or a Pokeball or... Um, you know, information that uh, technology has gained from the environment, like the body size of this person, bonus points if you recognize where it's from, or just um, or just a video call, um, no bonus points for this one. All of this is AR, so you're still living in the real world. You're still uh, the main environment around you is the real world. You're just adding digital stuff to it. Now, obviously, um, the the boundaries between these two AR and VR are fairly uh, or or can be can be blurry. So there is actually a continuum between reality and virtuality. And if you take Paul Milgram's definition of this reality virtuality continuum, uh, he drew this scale from the entirely real to the uh, entirely virtual. So let's go let's go through this. So we start with the everyday caveman, the everyday caveman who has no idea that 
digital worlds actually exist and he is living in 100% in the real world un un unless he ate some uh, bad fruit or poisonous uh, something in which case he may see hallucinations but that's but that's still not vr those hallucinations um <clears throat> and then we go to the next step where we add uh the so-called pass through ar so you raise your iPhone or iPad or uh, any kind of tablet or, or phone, you see the real world through the screen and the camera of that device, but you are actually seeing additional um, digital information added to that. So now we are in the realms of augmented reality. And we're also in the realms of augmented reality in the case of devices like the HoloLens, um, where you see the real world with your own eyes, so not through a camera and not to a display. You see the real world with your own eyes, but we can add uh, 3D objects, holograms into the real world <clears throat> using these devices. And then as we go forward and forward, uh, we arrive to virtual reality. So the real world just fades away. And as I said before, your eyes and ears can only experience the digital world. And if we go even one step further than that, <clears throat> then we then we reach the matrix, the 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 fully virtual world where even the users have no idea that they are in a virtual world. Uh, by the way, my friend James actually just had a very um, mind-expanding talk about this and the philosophical implications of the matrix yesterday at this conference. So I encourage you to look that up. So all of this is the reality, virtuality continuum, and the middle part of it uh, between the entirely real and the entirely virtual, the middle part of it is what is officially called mixed reality. But this is such a young industry that nobody really knows what to call things. So the, a lot of people in the industry are actually calling mixed, this mixed reality. So this is a VR experience that this uh, lady is playing in, but we can see her and the virtual world that she's in from a third person view. So um, the people who call this mixed reality, they thought that, okay, we have uh, VR and we have augmented reality with the reality. So this is a mix of the two and that's why they are gonna call it mixed reality. Officially, this is mixed reality, but uh, the industry, has not decided what to call anything just yet. So they they also call this mixed reality. <clears throat> XR, XR is another uh, uh, extended reality, the abbreviation of extended reality. And this is from the Unity website. So XR, XR according to Unity, is an umbrella term which uh, encompasses all the technology that powers virtual and augmented reality and mixed reality where they give a third definition here to that. So as you can see, terminology is a little bit fuzzy, but uh, hopefully uh, it will clear itself up in the, uh, in the long term. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how 3D illusion work. How, how can we trick your brain into thinking that it's in a, in a virtual 3D environment? So how do you see in 3D in real world? Well, you have two eyes, and those two eyes see the same object from slightly different perspectives. And the neural network in your brain basically combines these two pictures into one, um, uh, into one worldview, one three-dimensional worldview. So this is one of the ways that uh, you see in 3D. And we have to replicate this if you want to trick your brains into believing that the digital world it sees is actually a 3D. Uh, the other way that uh, <clears throat> you can perceive three dimension is when your head moves, and these can be very tiny micro movements, or these can be, these can be bigger movements. When your head moves, uh, the thing that's close to you moves at a different speed than the thing that's further from you. And again, the neural network in your brain combines this into a nice picture of uh, a three dimensional world. Um, but all of this change in the thing that you see has to be very close to how your head moves. Uh, so there is this uh, notion of movement photon delay, which is basically from the 
moment that your head moves, how much time passes until your eyes see the right, the corresponding image. And obviously, in, in the real world, it's this time is apart from some uh, fancy quantum uh, physics things, it's instantaneous. But in the computing world, there's no such thing as uh, as instantaneous. So um, we have found that if you if this latency is under certain milliseconds, which is basically 60 frames per second, then your brain still gets tricked into into believing uh, the illusion of 3D. So this is why frame rate and, and performance is super important if you're creating VR or AR applications, because otherwise if this latency uh, grows, then you can actually not just break the illusion, but cause the user to experience discomfort or even uh, motion sickness. Let's talk about the next term, which is degrees of freedom. So on the left side, you can see this uh, Lego figure and he's standing in one place, but his head is moving uh, left and right, up and down and rotating um, on his neck. So that's three different degrees of freedom, three different ways that his neck can move uh, or his head can move. Basically the head's orientation is moving. And that's why we call this three degrees of freedom because there are three different ways the head can move and obviously the combinations of these rotations <clears throat> as well. On the right hand side, you can see the same guy, but this time he can move. He can walk forward and backwards. He can move left or right, or he can, um, he can uh, move up and down by uh, squatting or jumping up. So that adds another three degrees of freedom, this kind of movement. And we get to six degrees of freedom, which basically is orientation and location. You're free to move in space in all six degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is another term that you will often hear when talking about the different devices and their capabilities. Let's talk about tracking. Tracking is the dark art of determining an object's location and orientation in space. So what, that, what it means is that we have to know where, for example, the user's head is in order to project the right images into their eyes um, and create the illusion of uh, them being in a 3D digital environment. So one of the ways this tracking happens is through something called an inertial measurement unit. This, uh, this is a fairly small piece of uh, equipment. It can be even much smaller than what you see in the picture here. It contains an accelerometer, a gyroscope uh, for rotation, magnetometer, and all of these are combined through some uh, fairly complicated mathematical functions called sensor fusion. But what we need to know is the output of this uh, device, this hardware device, is basically uh, an idea of how much the person has moved in the six degrees of freedom uh, space. So their orientation, how, how much has their orientation and how much their position in space has changed. So all of that is awesome and you would think, okay, uh, tracking is solved, but the problem with this is that this device, although it can provide you as much as a thousand uh, data points every second, this device is very inaccurate. Uh, it is uh, prone to drifting, which means that even if the uh, actual device is standing still, it will measure some some small movement or some small rotation. So it constantly needs to be reset to some, um, some reference of frame in order for you to, to be able to determine where the user's head is, again, to, in order to, to display the proper pictures uh, for both of their eyes. And <clears throat> one of the ways you can do this uh, additional, uh, one of the ways you can help this uh, 
uh, IMU in the in its tracking is called outside in tracking. So outside in tracking is uh, can be optical, magnetic, ultrasound, or constellation based, and uh, basically what's going on here is that uh, you have some fixed sensor in space, for example, a camera. And the camera is sensitive to the wavelength of these LEDs, which are fixed on the headset. And these LEDs, uh, they actually can uh, can also provide data by the, uh, the way they, they are um, turn themselves on and off. But basically, the, the important thing is that these uh, LEDs are placed in a strategic way on the device itself. So as you turn your head around, this uh, camera is going to see different views of the same um, constellation and it will see some of the LEDs and it will some of the LEDs will be obscured by either the user or the headset itself. So what's going on here is that uh, the camera can actually make a pretty good guess on where the headset is relative to the camera based on what it sees from these constellations. And this, uh, this external estimate, it's not fast to do. You can't do it a thousand times per second, but it's fast enough so that you can compensate for the tiny drifts of the IMU. So the IMU will uh, react to, uh, to the movement in a short term, but the uh, external tracking or the other tracking systems are going to fine tune that continuously so that the drifting is not going to be a problem. Um, this is this is how this uh, this setup looks. So here is the camera, and here is the device that you saw earlier, but you don't see the LEDs on this picture. Another way that uh, we can do tracking is uh, called sorry. Another way that we can do tracking is called the lighthouse tracking. And uh, just a small warning: if you're suffering from epilepsy or if you're prone to epilepsy, just please look away for a. Um, a minute or so until I finish playing this video. So this is a video um, that shows how the lighthouse tracking works. And basically what's happening is that uh, there is a laser um, that's uh, scanning the entire room and your headset actually has these tiny sensors. They are and when the laser shines into these sensors, the system can detect when that happens. And based on the time difference on when the laser hits the different sensors on your device, it can actually determine uh, the exact position and orientation of your headset compared to the uh, base station that you see flashing there in the corner. So. This is a very, very good method of tracking. This is still the most stable and precise tracking that's available for mere consumers if you don't want to go um, you know, in the, in the very, very expensive route. Another way um, that we can do tracking is called inside-out tracking. So what you see here is a SLAM-based inside-out tracking. And the way it works is that there is a camera taking photos of the, or basically taking a video of the environment. So this is the environment when your uh, camera and your headset is moving. And it, the computer vision system identifies these uh, feature points. So these are points where there is something interesting where which it can identify like a high contrast difference uh, in a certain area or something like that. And as you move in space, these feature points are constantly identified and then compared to how they were in the previous frame or the previous frames. And combining this knowledge of, of where these feature points were and the IMU, the system can uh, integrate all of this information and decide how much you have moved and where you have moved in space. The advantage of this approach is that you don't need anything, only the headset 
or this uh, method is actually available on phones as well. So only the headset and the, or the phone, you don't you don't need any external laser um, projection devices or cameras or whatnot. You can just use these feature points and determine how much the user has moved. The next term that is good to know is spatial mapping. What you see here is the spatial mapping of the HoloLens, uh, which has a time of flight sensor. Basically, it's kind of a radar, but it doesn't work with radio waves. It works with, uh, um, with infrared light. And what it does is um, it can determine the distance of certain things in your room, like the wall or the ceiling or the larger uh, furniture. And that way it can build a 3D model of your room, which is again, very important um, if you want to do stuff like occlusion. So this 3D model is very coarse. It, the triangles that it builds are, are fairly big. You can't really do it, use it for 3D scanning a small object, but it is good enough to determine where the walls are or where the ceiling is or where a table is so that you can actually place a hologram onto that table because the system will know where the table's spatial coordinates are. The other thing is occlusion. Imagine that uh, you're playing a game and there's something behind your wall. If, um, if you use spatial mapping, then you can occlude that um, monster or something behind your wall so that it doesn't show, you, you can't see it through the wall, which is something uh, that uh, most of us who have worked with HoloLens or any of these devices have experienced, but it's a very uneasy feeling to see something beyond behind a solid object like a wall or a table. And uh, it can make you feel pretty uncomfortable. So spatial mapping can help with that. Now, some devices like the latest iPhones are actually using LiDAR sensors, so laser-driven uh, distance measurement sensors um, to determine the uh, position of, uh, of real-world objects in the world. And it works much better than the HoloLens uh, spatial mapping works, but the, same, the, but the principle is the same. It is good for occlusion. It is good for, for uh, you know, object placement and many other things. So, what if you, what if you walk, for example, what if you place um, a virtual glass on your table, a digital holographic glass on your table, and then you walk out of the room and then you come back. So you would expect the glass to be on the same place, right? Even if you come back a week later, just like you would expect your actual real glass to be on the same place where you left it. Um, to do this, um, we are using something called spatial anchors or persistence. And this, the, uh, this is basically works by remembering these feature points either on the device or in the cloud or remembering where you were in the spatial map. And as the spatial map builds up when you have turned on the device, it realizes, oh, I've been in this room and I have put something at coordinate 10, 10, 20. So I will put the same thing at the same place and the illusion is gonna be the same. You're gonna see the same hologram at the same place where you left it a couple of weeks ago. This is actually something pretty incredible to experience if, when you first see it. Okay, so let's talk about displays. When you were young, I'm pretty sure that your parents or grandparents have warned you a number of times not to stand too close to the TV set because it can uh, hurt your eyes. And now, with the AR and VR glasses, what we're doing is we're actually putting two of those displays right next to our eyes, like a couple millimeters or centimeters apart from there from our eyes. So I think that's funny, but these are these are so-called near eye displays, and they have a couple of interesting properties. So one of those properties would be a resolution, and just looking at these comparison picture, you can immediately see but that, that yes, the resolution on the left is higher than the resolution on the right. 
But we're actually not talking about resolution when we're talking about these headsets. We're talking about pixels per degree, which is analog to what you have on your phone, pixels per inch. So how many pixels are in one degree of field of view? And obviously, if the number of pixels in that degree is higher, then the picture is going to be sharper than on the right side where you can't even read the text and the numbers. So this is going to be pixels per degree. This is one of the most important uh, properties of image quality when it comes to both AR and VR headsets. When, we go, when we're talking about number of pixels, vertical and horizontal pixels, um, we have to also take into account the field of view. So a human field of view is about 200 degrees, which means that if you, if you move your hand out here, it's about 200 degrees uh, where you can still see it from the corner of your eye. Uh, but none of these displays actually uh, do that. Well, there are some VR displays that can do that can do 180-ish uh, degrees. But uh, as for AR displays, none of those can do that. So the human field of view is 200 degrees. And to make sense of the pixels per degree, you multiply it by the number of, for example, horizontal degree, then you get the number of horizontal pixels. The same goes for vertical. And why it's important is because the larger the number of pixels you have, the more computing power it takes to render a 3D image. And it just think about it, it it's already pretty hard to render uh, a stable 60 frames per second on a, on an, for example, on an Xbox uh, uh, in full HD. And some of these devices actually have uh, two, four, uh, two, two K displays or even higher resolution displays. So one for each eye. So you just imagine that we immediately have to use a mobile device. If your, if your VR headset is a mobile device like this Oculus Quest, we have to use a mobile device, mobile battery, it's not plugged into the wall, mobile GPU to feel four times as much pixels and probably at a higher frame rate than your Xbox does. And that kind of explains why the graphics that we can achieve in VR is still um, years behind what we can do on, on consoles. But th this is the reason. There is an immense amount of computing power. And if you drop from 60 frames to 50 frames, then you're going to have problems because the user may actually get sick if you're not careful. So you have to keep a constant 60 or pro or in some areas 70 or 80 or 100 uh, frames per second. So the computing power requirements are, are pretty big compared to just your usual uh, PC games. The other thing about VR displays is that because the pixels are relatively so big, you can see the grid between them. And this grid uh, is called the screen door effect. So the screen door effect is this, is this grid between them. Uh, nowadays, the latest um, generation of uh, VR displays, the pixels are so small that you can barely see the screen door effect. And there are, these, there are devices where you cannot see the screen door effect at all. So basically, we, we have uh, achieved retina resolution. But that requires an immense amount of computing power to, to fill that with meaningful information. There are also two kinds of VR displays, two, uh, two big families, LCD and OLED. OLED is going to bring you darker blacks, but uh, LCD is going to bring you higher reaction time. So pick your poison, pick your compromise. When we talk about AR displays, things are much less advanced and much, much less nice to look at. Um, there are two um, big families of, uh, of AR displays. Uh, one of them is the waveguide. The other one is this optical combiner, which again has a couple of uh, subcategories, but we're not going to go into that. But the thing here is 
with AR displays, you want to see the real world with your own eyes. And that means that whatever you see the digital world through has to be at least semi-transparent. So here on both sides, you can see the real world's picture coming into your eyes and going through this semi-transparent mirror here, which reflects the digital thing, the projector onto your eyes um, through this, uh, through this uh, mirror-ish surface. Uh, waveguides are even more complicated. So you have this projector uh, which projects light into a very thin uh, plastic um, piece, uh, piece of plastic. And then the every single pixel bounces sometimes millions of times in a very precisely pre-calculated manner uh, in this lens until it arrives to your eye. So just to... Just as an example, this is the HoloLenses display. So you have three different colored lasers. You have two mirrors, a fast mirror and a slow mirror, uh, which constantly move left and right, up and down, and reflect the light that way. And all of this gets into the waveguide, which is displayed here. Uh, and then inside the waveguide, you have these grades and very precisely designed um, shapes that is that are going to reflect the light a million times in a way that it actually arrives into your eye. Now just think about how complicated this waveguide is and how complicated the effect manufacturing process is. The tolerance of these grades, so the the amount of uh, of error we allow is in the 10 picometer range. So that's one tenth of the size of a hydrogen atom. So it's not it's not a surprise that the actual picture that we see has discoloration and different light, uh, different strengths. But surprising is, or different brightness level, sorry. But surprising is that there is a picture at all. Now, there are more advanced light field uh, waveguides that have better pictures and somewhat better field of views. But due to some physics constraints, the waveguide display as it is today um, cannot really advance beyond about 40 degrees. So you will not reach the, um, the 100, 110, 120 degree field of view of, an, of a VR um, we are headset with this technology. But the reason they use this technology is because it can allow the real world to go, to, uh, the picture of the real world to go through and into your eyes. So you don't want to watch art with waveguide, but to be honest, what the HoloLens is useful for, which is industry usage, uh, in this scenario, you would not really care that this blue arrow and this blue arrow are exactly the same color. The important thing is that they are in the right place and they are displayed properly. And the next thing I want to talk about is focal distance. So uh, I think we, we, we're going to skip this, but it's very important that you have to have your glasses if you're a glass wearer like me. Um, you want to have it under the headset, and if you can, then you have to create and, and uh, order these special lenses just for you so that you can wear that. Uh, all of these displays have one fixed focal distance, so that means that the, the light is coming from the displays in a way that it's either two meters or half meter or whatever distance as a focus distance. And that causes a problem. So we have this virgins accommodation conflict, which is a big word that you want to remember uh, if you want to be like the Hulk. Um, <clears throat> so virgins is when your both of your eyeballs are looking at something. And if that something is very close to you, then you, have, you will have this cross-eyed effect. Um, accommodation is how your, the lenses in your eyes actually focus the light. So you can see here that the hole itself is sharp, but the forest beyond, beyond it is blurry. And the reason for that is that you can't really focus on both. Now, if you're using a hologram, one of, one of the HoloLens devices before, and you have 
something really close to you, then your mind is used to changing the focus, focal distance of your eyes accordingly. But the HoloLens picture is at a fixed focal distance, which means that uh, your mind doesn't know what to do. If it changes the focal distance, then like it used to in your decades of life experience, then you won't get a clear picture. And that's gonna cause a conflict uh, which can actually cause, again, physical discomfort and even, um, even uh, headache and other sicknesses. So to solve this, um, we have something called the light fields, which is a very experimental technology. But basically, you can see here that the person's hand and the rover that he has in, he holds in his hand are at the same focal distance, but the planet at the distance is blurry, and now the planet is clear, and this area is is um, is blurry as the user has focused uh, far at the uh, at the planet. There's another company called Serial, which is also doing like field uh, technology. I encourage you to to look up their websites if you want to know more. So let's talk very, very quickly about audio. I am running out of time here. So spatial audio is the notion that you have source, a sound coming from different directions. So even though this uh, person has two speakers in their headphones, spatial audio allows them to hear the sound of the spaceship not just from the left or right, but also from front of them or behind them. There's some very complicated math uh, behind this, but as developers, it is very, very easy to access uh, this feature and it can greatly enhance the, the immersiveness of uh, any experience or, or work app that you're creating. So just know that it is a solved problem that we have spatial audio and we can make sound come from any direction um, wherever we want. Okay, so the next thing is haptic feedback. This is the Oculus Quest controller taken apart. Um, <clears throat> and it haptic feedback basically here works much like your phone when it buzzes. There are also experiments around, uh, uh, around touch gloves. So the idea here is that uh, Sorry, this contraption actually holds your hand back as you want to uh, make a fist. And that is going to make you feel like you're holding an actual object which resists your, your grip. Um, I've tried some of these uh, and none of them could fool my brain into thinking that I'm actually doing what my eyes see that I'm doing. So there's a lot of area for uh, innovation here. Okay, next uh, slide. You have all, all kinds of these crazy contraptions. I'm not going to talk too much about them. So what kind of input possibilities you have into your device? Tracking is a way to input things. Um, so obviously that inputs data. You have hand tracking, you have speech recognition. Head tracking we already talked about, which is crucial to... Uh, provide the illusion of 3D. And you have these uh, different controllers, which, by the way, themselves have constellation tracking and they have uh, different buttons and joysticks and whatnot. We also have eye tracking, uh, which is what uh, you think it does, uh, which, which does what you think it does. Basically, uh, it uh, recognizes, it has two cameras for your eyeballs and recognizes where you're looking. So you can use it to just magically think of a button or focus on a button and just say select and that button is going to be activated. Or you can use it for something uh, very interesting called foveated rendering. Here the red reticle is basically showing you where the user is looking. And if we turn on foveated rendering, uh, what you can see is that only the area where the user is looking at is going to be sharp, the rest is going to be blurry. Because the way the human eye works is that you only see sharply in the middle, the center of your view, this is called the fovea. Uh, that 
we can actually save a lot of computing power by not rendering the the peripheral view at a higher resolution and at a high quality. So that's full width rendering. There's not a few, not a lot of headsets, and there's no commercial headset that does this with eye tracking. But these are actually coming, and uh, you will see them soon enough. Okay, let's talk very quickly about pass through AR. So we've already saw pass through AR where you have a camera on this iPad and you see the real world with the iPad's camera and the digital world. So the advantage here is that you can actually subtract light, which is something that you can't do with the waveguide. So you can add blacks and shadows and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> you can also use it for interactive special effects or CGI without a movie studio, which is always fun to do. Uh, you can use it for GPS. You can use it for measuring stuff, which is great because you have a $1,000 phone to measure things that, and less precisely than a $1 measuring tape would, but it's fun to do. You can use it for face filters, which is probably the most uh, well-known um, applications of uh, of AR and most of the people using it are not even aware that AR as a term exists. So that's all, that's always fun. The problem with pass through AR is that uh, you have, you see the, you, if you're using a headset, the problem with pass through AR is that the actual reality is in very bad quality. So don't look at the game here. This is a cool game, by the way, but don't look at the game, look at the background. And you can see that the background is very, very bad quality. You have no chance of, for example, using your laptop this way because you can't read anything uh, on your screen. So if reality is important to you, then unfortunately these past three AR, even though it has much better quality for the digital content is not not feasible you <coughs> sorry you, you can't really use it and yeah this is a, this is a headset that has very very good and high quality pass through air but still it cannot escape physics the actual cameras that are recording the real world are not where your eyes are because otherwise you wouldn't have eyes so the actual cameras are not where your eyes are, and that's messing a little bit with your spatial perception. And I would like to uh, to stop with uh, mentioning Tilt 5, which is a very interesting um, project. Basically, this is an AR tabletop gaming system. And uh, what it does is that you have these AR glasses, which have projectors in them. So projectors like what you have in a conference room. And these projectors project the two images for your two eyes onto this retro reflective surface, bounces back to your eyes, and uh, there are um, polarized filters in your in your eyes. So you only, the left eye only see what, what belongs to the left eye, and the right eye only see what belongs to the right eye. And this way, in the limited area of the tabletop, you have very, very good AR. This is a this is a video that's shot through the lens. So this is this is actually worse than the real world because of some artifacts uh, with the camera. But uh, this is what it looks like. It this is 3D. This is fully colorful. It has blacks. It has full occlusion because the light is actually coming from the surface. Uh, reflected back to you. It has a very wide field of view, and what it's uh, what it's for is is you know gaming and enjoying each other's company, kind of a futuristic uh, tabletop gaming system. So, I just wanted to show you this to you at the end because with just the simple limitation of limiting the AR area to the to the table. Uh, Tilt 5 actually solves a ton of the other problems, occlusion, versions, accommodation, conflict, and, and a lot of other problems uh, by just introducing this one limitation. I think this is, um, this is the genius of innovation, and there's always, always time uh, and place for innovation. So the last thing I want to tell you is that I'm going to have another 
talk, uh, which is uh, uh, going to be a pre-recorded talk in a couple of hours. Will AI take the job of Excel developer? So if you're a developer, and especially if you're an Excel developer, you don't want to miss this. And with that, thank you for your attention. We have a couple of minutes for questions, I think. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, until now, I talked, I know, knew a little bit about this technology, but when I was talk, seeing the presentation, several things came to my mind that I didn't know. And uh, oh, you, you, you talked about some concepts that for us are simple because we are the users, but we didn't understand that the complexity of doing those things. And you explain why things are not so easy to, to accomplish. You know, it was very interesting to, to realize that. And I'm glad and, you found it useful. <laughs> yeah, very, 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 thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but some are already answered. One was the Varjo XR3, uh, which was, uh, it's not using uh, uh, the standard displays, it's using pass-through, so I think it, it was answered when, when you showed the, the headset in the pass-through session. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's it's very good, but it's it's still not going to be as good as reality. I mean, you just physically can't be as good. Yeah, it's true. Then I have some comments uh, regarding links that also come in as standalone pass through AR and Unreal and LG LG U plus that is working in Korea. So um, actually, do you want to do any further comments? Uh, I have. Uh, a lot of questions, but we don't have time for to answer <laughs> the, the, the questions right now. And uh, um, I think it was a, a real precise presentation about simple concepts that are complex from technology point of view. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we will keep uh, um, this running. Okay? All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. All right.